Okay, so today we are going to talk about um, reinforcement learning. Can you hear me? Thank you. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the view. Okay, fantastic. All right. So we're talking about reinforcement learning, which is a different type of um, learning that we had done before. In fact, sometimes people separate the different types of learning as supervised and supervised, which is what we did uh, last Thursday. And finally, reinforcement, which is the subject of today's lecture. I wanted to tell you that uh, when it comes to supervised learning and unsupervised learning, the, where I've given you a new with the notebooks, we're just touching the surface of all the many things you could do with these techniques. In particular, we just did a simple example for convolutional neural networks, but uh, a lot of physics problems can be posed as a, a type of image recognition in which CNNs are extremely useful. And we haven't gone over all possible applications that can be can be used in case of uh, CNNs. But the, at least my, my intention was to give you some idea of what these techniques are, some of the key concepts, at least a starting notebook so that you get at least uh, used to uh, coding and calling to all these pre-made uh, libraries and functionalities of TensorFlow and that you may be able to incorporate these ideas into your own research and in your own data set. Okay. So just to say that, uh, of course, in one hour or two hours, we cannot cover but at all all the density of information that is in these techniques. And this is just an intro. It's a, it's a way for you to get in and when you need to apply to your own research, at least you know where to start. And this is going to be the same for reinforcement learning. It's a very active and interesting area in machine learning, uh, which I think has been very, like, not used in physics and probably can be used a lot more. But uh, it's by itself also a, a whole area of uh, uh, trying to solve issues, problems um, that are completely different from supervised and unsupervised. Okay, so the idea is that um, we learn uh, supervised learning. Uh, we had a data set and some labels, and with many, many techniques, we started becoming better at teaching the machine to learn. Right? Um, and uh, in supervised learning, there are important techniques that we have not covered and are actually quite important in physics, like variational autoencoders and generative adversarial networks, or GANs, which are based on a set of um, algorithms that are called generative models in deep neural networks. In particular, if you are doing particle physics, I would advise you to oops, sorry, go over GANs. And I personally think that a good starting point is these lectures that I, I show here. Uh, GANs are really powerful when it comes to particle physics. At the end of the day, what uh, all the techniques we've done before and also VAs or GANs are, are cool ways to accelerate the learning, capture important aspects of the data that might be too subtle for a, a human to actually understand and also the ability to incorporate different types of data, not just, you know, a particular type, but, you know, many sets of data all together at once. Um, but at the end of the day, what we are doing is to teach a machine to learn from humans to do what humans do already do, maybe less efficiently, uh, and maybe with not, uh, with re humans would require higher level of data in order to see or understand what's going on. But at the end of the day, it's the same. Uh, the learning is made from humans, it's guided by, uh, guided by us. So the idea of reinforcement learning is to try to go a step beyond. It's uh, try to teach a machine to become better than a human at completing a high level task. 
that seems like a difficult thing to do, but that's precisely what uh, uh, reinforcement learning has been able to achieve. The first thing we need is a difficult task, okay? And when we think on difficult, probably we don't think on tasks that are, um, let me just go back for a second. Just remember, for example, the minced uh, data set. Those are images, they have pixels, and uh, what the CNN had to do was to try to find re relations among all these pixels and the density of gray they had to try to find and identify better sevens, twos, fives, and so on. When it comes to particle physics, this is uh, very similar as well. Sometimes you have event displays, for example, uh, that might be very subtle in the sense that the features of a uh, jet might be difficult to acquire, but they are still there, you know, it's just a, a straightforward task. One image, identify it, period, that's it. But when it, we, it, we think about very difficult tasks, tasks that are really like humans, that um, require a strategy, uh, we can think, for example, uh, on chess truly difficult uh, task that is what we will think that is a uh, human it's not just that a machine can do faster or with lower resolution uh, so it's not a task of simply identifying patterns in the data but a truly difficult task is probably to develop a strategy and in doing so to become better than a human at developing a strategy to for example winning again when we also think about humans and uh, their ability to, to develop their intelligence, often we think about, well, maybe not often, but think on chess players, which are supposed to be people who are able to think about many different moves and all possibilities or many possibilities that could appear when their opponent also moves, think several steps ahead, and also maintain a level of a strategy to, to be able to win, okay? So in chess, uh, which is a high level activity, I would say different players develop different strategies. Okay. The goal is to win the game, is to, it's a long-term goal. And in fact, uh, to achieve that particular goal, Important pieces, let's say that the queen, might be sacrificed in some moves just because this will allow us to arrive to the goal, which is the checkmate. And um, even though you as a human are thinking about a strategy to achieve to che a, a checkmate, your opponent, your adversary, is going to start moving as well and devising its own strategy. So in other words, you need to revise and reassess your strategy at every move. And also, as you know, probably from a uh, you know, typical story of the, uh, of the you know, grains of uh, rice, the combinatorics is ginormous when it comes to chess. Nevertheless, uh, very high level and very difficult task, but in February 96, uh, a machine, the blue, beat Gary Kasparov, which at that time was the world champion. And he did it again many times after. So one big benchmark, if you want, which was, can a machine actually beat the best player of chess, the best human on this very high level task? And the answer was yes. And since a long time, 96. I don't know you are too young to remember that, that moment, but it was a big splash, at least in the Western media. Now, the blue, all what it was doing, it wasn't doing artificial intelligence, or sorry, it wasn't doing machine learning. It was doing a brute force computing power. For each move, it was uh, computing lots of different possibilities many hundreds of millions of positions per second to be able to assess and reassess the strategy it will take. Now, because uh, we were already like uh, shocked by all this, 
maybe we didn't pay so much attention to what happened in 2015, at least in the Western world, I imagine, which is in October 2015, a machine, AlphaGo Zero, was able to beat the professional Go player. Now, the, play, the game of Go is a, a very popular in Asia and not so much in Western countries. Um, and that's why maybe we didn't realize that the, this was such a big deal. But I think in Asia they did realize, and sometimes this moment in 2015 has been identified as the moment where China in particular decided to start focusing a lot on developing AI applications. Because back then it seems like a lot was about uh, AI, AI is going to be great and solve everything and so on, but it was that moment in which a machine could be the master of Go when, uh, you know, people realized that it was actually powerful. In 2015, that machine, that uh, AlphaGo Zero, was, all, was increased its ability to develop a very good strategy by learning from playing against itself, where itself was uh, playing with some randomness uh, added to all the games. So by collecting all this data that was playing with itself once and then over and over and over and over again, was able to become very, very good at playing Go. But even a more important, I would say, a step was taken in 2017 where an improvement from this algorithm or this machine, the called Alpha Zero, builds on a DNN or the deep neural networks to beat the world champions, not just in Go, but in chess and Shogi. By that, uh, by that time, the world champions in chess were not humans anymore, were actually computer programs. But one single algorithm, one single machine was able to develop strategies for all these very different games. And did that by using reinforcement learning, which is the subject of today's lecture. It's a new paradigm of learning. Let me just tell you about this Go game I never played, so I, or I never played this particular game, something similar, but it's essentially a game that um, apparently looks very simple. And if you have ever tried to teach your children uh, play chess, you know that there is like a threshold or how much they need to learn how the different pieces move, all the different rules and so on, in order to start actually playing and developing a winning strategy. Go is not like this. It's very simple. In the sense that the moves are simple, there is no hierarchy like chess, and the goal is to place your, let's say, pieces, black and white, then surround and capture as many of opponents' pieces as you can. They have simple rules, but it has extreme levels of complexity when building strategies because um, there are many things you can do in order to achieve that very simple goal, which is to surround and capture as many of the opponents' pieces. Um, in particular, the, the board of a Go is a 19 times 19 board and the idea is that uh, you keep playing and playing and playing, creating strategically spaces or placing your, your, your pieces in strategically as to be able to finally capture at the end of the day when all the moves are done, you look at the board and you see how many of the opponents you have captured and vice versa. And whoever gets more wins. P pretty simple, right? But no machine could beat a Go master until 2015. Whereas chess being in principle a more higher level in the sense that it's more difficult to learn the rules, it, um, it was done many, many years before. So I want to discuss with you guys why this is so difficult. First of all, can you tell me how would you teach a machine to learn this game? Let's say that uh, we try to do this a la supervised. Uh, so we need to build a data set of X and Ys. Can anybody tell me what the X could be and what the Ys could be?
should I ask a question or if somebody wants to go ahead and, you know, throw some idea out there? This I may not... try. Yeah, go ahead. Already, uh, you. Maybe you can, I don't know, show the X maybe some uh, game from beginning to end and the Y, the winner, the black or the white. Okay, so that's, uh, that's good. That could be a possibility. Any other possibility? So what uh, Roberto says is you could record games, many games, where X is all the data of uh, the place, let's say, the board configuration in the different iterations, so the different uh, steps until the end of the game, and the Y will be the result. White or black wins. That's right, no? Roberto, that's what you had in mind. Yes, exactly. Any other idea? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, maybe you can just show the, um, so in chess you can, you're learning not by the playing a game, you're learning by uh, looking at different combination of action you can do. I mean, like as you, when you're teaching kids, so you can do the same for machine, so you can show the different um, sets of action, how you can play in different situations that will lead you to win. Mm -hmm. Maybe this okay. can be X and why will be the winning of you? So you say, okay, so X could be winning strategies. So, uh, for example, yes, indeed, when you learn chess, you, you are told, for example, this is the best way to start, or there are different ways to start that are more advantageous. And if you are in this situation, then you might want to do that and so on, right? So it's like uh, taking pieces of uh, your uh, the possible moves um, that typically lead to a, a, a win. And yes. here we mean typically because that's not, uh, it's just a part of your game that you are showing. Okay. So now we are, that you are there. When we think about, what is your name? Sorry. The one Maria Antonova. Hi, Maria. Then uh, here in the game of Go. Um, how would you do that? Like, may I guess my question is, given that in Go all the pieces are the same, they don't have a particular, um, how to say, hierarchy. A piece is a piece, and it's not a horse or a queen or whatever. So a lot of the strategies are based precisely on the hierarchy that uh, comes from being a queen or a horse or so, right? or the starting moves uh, that are often done with a pawn or a, or, a, or, a, say, or a horse. Here, all the pieces are the same. And also, the dimensionality is much bigger. So do you think, Maria, that um, here there could be um, many more possible strategies, if at all? But maybe here you can just look uh, at this uh, like uh, as a picture, yes. so and look for the patterns. And as the, with the picture recognition, you're just saying, okay, in this pattern, uh, I in this pattern, if you put uh, another piece like black or white, it may lead to give you a priority, or it may decrease your chances to win. Maybe you yeah. can just do this. Yes, Sally, so you say maybe by looking at uh, patterns that appear more recurrent, let's say, in, um, in uh, games where, let's say, the white uh, uh, played and uh, won, maybe I know that this pattern, if it appears, is a good sign. That's all very good. What, whatever, what Roberto said, what Maria said, they are very good um, ideas on what you will do. And it's indeed trying step by step, either teaching whole games, but or trying step by step to think on what is a good pattern or a good strategy in the sense of a good distribution uh, in a given point during your game. Now, this is all very good. And this is, of course, what people uh, 
this, let me go back here, when uh, alpha goes zero, beats a professional Go player. What it does is to play against itself and again and again and again. Because of course, imagine the dimensionality of this 19 times 19 is like uh, if you think that there are three possibilities for each of these uh, squares over here, we are talking about around 10 to the 172 configurations, right, that you could have. So we are talking about a, an enormous amount of combinatorics. And from those uh, uh, combinatorics that uh, in principle, we would like to be able to simulate, which we are not able to simulate, but at least try to. We also need to draw conclusions, and conclusions that are long term, not just step by step. It's not like from one move to the next, we already know we are going to win. And in fact, the game can evolve quite fast from a situation where it looks like one player is winning, and in the last few moves, then the other gets an edge and wins. We are talking about a, a problem that is very combinatorial. So, of course, asking Go Masters to go and record this data is impossible. And that's why to increase the data set to learn from, uh, what AlphaGo Zero did was to play against itself. So, it repeated this with some randomness, trying to emulate what humans will do, and uh, to actually collecting a huge data set. But this wasn't good enough. Um, we in actu actually to be able to beat and to develop strategy, strategies all the time without having to develop uh, huge data sets and then mine on them and then trying to understand what's going on, we needed something else. And that's what uh, reinforcement learning did. It's a paradigm shift in the way we learn. So, oh, trying to learn uh, the Go game strategies, uh, the, this, the main difficulty came from that amount of combinatorics. And also the fact that, uh, like in chess, we are talking about uh, something, some goal that is long term, where, you know, again, sacrifices, bad moves, if you, see, if you think about them, may, can be made. Uh, to the benefit of a longer term winning. Again, like the story of sacrificing your queen. That's something that I don't, I'm not a, a good chess player at all, but I imagine that it's an important piece and you don't want to sacrifice it. You don't have to. So it really has to be to achieve something important, some, to actually arrive to checkmate. And um, when you as humans learn how to play any game, let's say chess, you start learning the moves, then you just play a bit randomly doing stuff that is short sighted if you want, like uh, if you start playing as a kid, you probably start trying to just uh, capture as many pieces as you, as you can, keeping all the important pieces, like protecting your queen or your horse or making sure you surround your, your king and so on. But uh, as you become better at these kind of games, you probably develop a longer term view in which you are not just thinking of the first one or two steps ahead, where you are just thinking on the longer term. You are actually able to compute in your head what you are going to do in the next three or five moves and what the opponent, the different options that the opponent is going to take. So in your mind, you are kind of building a tree of possibilities. If now I do this, then my opponent can do this or this or this, and then I could do that. You can imagine that it develops a very long tree. And the better player you are, the more you are able to actually foresee what is going to happen later on and what is more likely to happen. So you're computing probabilities in your mind. And as Maria said, sometimes you become better by just being guided by like rough strategies of where is a good start or when you are in that particular set of situations, you do that, right? But in general, if you are really good at chess, you, what you are doing is lots of computations of trees of possibilities in your mind and computing the probability of each of these, those, the estimating the probability of each of those happening given 
a longer term reward. Okay? But as you do that at each step, your opponent will take an, a, a, the opposite step, right? It will take the next step, and then you will have to recompute, and so on and so forth, right? So you, you as you are playing and developing your strategy, you also have to reassess it at every move. That's what reinforcement learning is trying to do. The task of getting better at Go was too difficult because there were too many possibilities. And no human could teach from example just because he didn't have enough. It wasn't, humans were unable to build data sets that were uh, long or uh, large enough as to be able to mine on them. So to beat humans, we had to allow machines to learn in a different way. Not from us, not from our example, but actually um, guided by a different principle than just trying to reproduce a data set to the, the, the best extent we can, it's just because we now have that data set. So what we need in terms of uh, arriving to a strategy is to make machi machines learn to make good sequence of decisions, not just one decision, not just one set of little, uh, you know, decisions, but sequences of decisions that leave or arrive to the best long-term goal. So this um, um, algorithm needs to deal with delay labels and uh, be able to develop a long-term strategy. So it's not like, uh, for example, in the use of CNN when uh, dealing with images and trying to classify them. There you have an image, and you're trying to classify this image. Now we are trying to find out what, let's say, if with a snapshot of the current game, how this is going to evolve in the future very far away. So in the enforcement learning, what you need to do is to actually kind of scout out there possibilities, ways in which the game can evolve and can lead to better or worse outcomes. So we need, as you can imagine, also we need to reassess as the game is changing because as you do decide to make a step, your opponent is going to make a step as well. And then you need to reassess because your environment is changing. So you make another step and so on. So it needs to be some form of iterative way of improving your strategy which can as well examine or at least scout the possibilities of some possible new steps ahead. So the building block of reinforcement learning is the following. It's the idea that you are going to have an agent think on you as a player that is going to interact with an environment, which is the game, that is at that moment is in a state ST, uh, at that particular moment, think of that being the snapshot of how the game, the board is right now with all the pieces there and all the pieces that you still can put. And it, based on that particular environment and this state at this particular point, it takes actions. Now, what action it takes at that particular moment, it will be based on something that we will set that is called a reward. And the reward is for that particular state, for that particular moment, is a reward called RT. This reward is telling you how good your current state is. For example, um, whether that particular move is likely to give you a good outcome in the long term or not so likely. And the reward that you get from a particular action is what will tell you uh, whether you are doing good at that particular moment. Now, the goal of all this iterative process is to maximize a total reward, reward that you get at the end of the game. This is called a return. So at each step, you, you take an action which changes the environment, and given that change, you get a reward. Then you take another action changes the environment, and then you take a reward, and so on and so forth. And at the end, you decide when the game finishes. In, that, in the case of Go, it will be when all the pieces are in the board. Um, based on that, 
you collect the, the whole reward. And the winning or losing is to achieve the highest reward. Okay, so some things we need to discuss about reinforcement learning, some concepts. First of all, is that the state uh, the, it's also sometimes called an observation, although it's not the same. The observation is simply what you can actually, the information you actually know about the state. But the state could be bigger than that. In the case of Go, there is no difference because you see the world and you know what it is. But you can imagine that in other real life applications, your, the number of observations you make on a, on a state might be reduced because you don't know everything about the state. And there might be hidden things that may actually impact on what uh, your final outcome will be. So in practice, this state of observation will be some kind of tensor. For example, in the case of Go, uh, you could introduce the information of the state as an image that uh, shows the ball. And this image will be, you want a matrix 19 times 19 with a uh, a coding for being empty, having a white piece or a black piece. The action that you take is essentially a possible transformation on the state. In chess, could be move this pawn to that position. In Go, it could be place this uh, piece in that particular position, which essentially is taking that state and changing it. Um, a policy is the rule you used as an agent to decide what action to take. Think again on Go or, or chess. You have the state of your board and you could take many uh, possible moves. You could decide to move a different uh, piece in different positions. And how you decide that, this is the, the decision making is called the policy. And this policy, that will, pi over here, that will determine the action you take, usually is a function of the state. So we parameterize the policy as a function of the state. So in what Maria was saying, your policy may include some of these strategies in which, for example, if my king is in this particular position and I'm threatened by, let's say, a couple of moves a horse could, uh, you know, do checkmate, then I decide to move it to the left or to the right or to exchange with a tower or something like that. That would be the policy. And it could be, as you can imagine, a very complicated uh, function of the current state. This um, <clears throat> policy <coughs> can be deterministic, or so it can be based on heuristic rules or a specific function of your state. So if you give me a state, I tell you exactly what to do. But more often when we are dealing with complex situations, the policy tends to be stochastic. Sorry, I didn't write it correctly. Stochastic means that there is some level of randomness in what you are going to do. Some level of randomness in the choices you will make as policy, as action, based on the current state. And as you can imagine, when again, when we are talking about huge combinatorics like in Go, Chess, and so on, or in real life applications, you actually want to parameterize these policies with parameters that you can scan over. And those parameters are often, for example, represented with this symbol, theta. And this is a way of modeling uh, the, po the policies based on a single parameter that you are just scanning over. But also the policy, if it's good, if it's going to lead to a long-term return, it needs to be a policy that is guided by some level of understanding of possible trajectories, if you want, that your future stakes could take. So your policy needs to be able to somehow be informed by you uh, scouting possibilities in the future. So a way of doing this, or so the way we will do it, is to think on trajectories in which, for example, you could start with a state at zero, take an action at a zero, then move to state S1, take an action at A1, and so on. 
this trajectory can be extremely complicated and it has to be done with the states that are possible, actions that are possible, and accounting for how this previous action is going to influence the presence of the next state. So as you can imagine, this sampling among possibilities is highly non-trivial. But again, go back to your way of playing chess, if you do, the more you become, the more you are actually doing that. You are thinking on trajectories of when you move, on what you decide to move, what piece you move. You are also thinking of what the opponent is going to do in the next step, and then what you will do to, to actually counteract that movement and the opponents and so on. And you are thinking several steps ahead, which means you are actually analyzing many of these possible trajectories. And on all, all of those trajectories, you try to find which one will give you the best long-term return. Now, since this scouting of possibilities and sampling of possible trajectories and how to then find the best policy is hard, this is often done with deep neural networks. And that's why in this case, nowadays, you will actually work on deep reinforcement. Now, this is um, uh, how neural networks are used to sampling and developing best strategies is a, let's say, it will be a few hours uh, lecture to be able to explain it properly so that you actually understand it. And there are many ways of doing it based on many types of initial uh, parameterization for your policies. And uh, of course, we don't have time for that, but uh, at least I'll give you the main concepts so that you are aware that in order to sample and develop a good strategy, you actually need to use deep learning. And then it's called deep reinforcement. What other concepts we need to take into account? Well, then there is this issue of the reward. The reward is once you take a, an action based on policy, you make the environment change. And the reward is there to make sure that is kind of guiding you to developing the best policy. So some function of the current state, state sorry, the action you've taken and what uh, this action has uh, done to change the state to the next state. The return is simply the total reward in a full sequence. So it's following a trajectory the reward will be collecting, sorry, the return, the total return will be collecting all the little rewards you gain at each step. Okay, so the idea is that you want to maximize return. So you want to maximize the amount of rewards you collect along a trajectory. And in principle, this problem, scouting over the trajectories may be hard, but uh, this problem, which is finding if you want a path and counting how many rewards you get is it cannot it's not going to be that hard but um, you could find yourself that in real situations if you just simply do this you are going to end up with the situation that the best reward or return sorry is going to be obtained by simply playing an infinite amount of times which is not what we want and certainly this is not what happened in real life so in real problems, those uh, rewards cannot be collected at infinitum, and you cannot just make all the moves you want. The real problems have limitations, and not all trajectories can be taken at no cost. For example, um, typical real uh, life problems have time limits, or each time you take a step, you actually lose something. So there is, this is something we need to take into account. So one simple way of taking these limitations into account and to reduce the possible trajectories you are going to scout for is introducing a discount where the total reward is not just collecting the total return, oh, it's not just collecting rewards, but actually you are paying a price at each step. This is so uh, Veronica, sorry, what is big T here? Is the time at which you are or what is 
uh, or is the total time? I mean, is the total so, number yeah. of steps? Yeah. But the total number of steps. I mean, this is a reward you have to apply at each step, no? Yes. Uh, so the what? It, so you you just count the rewards in in the whole sequence until you. Get, uh, until you, you finish the sequence. Exactly, until you finish the sequence. So let's Please. say the, the reward at time t is the sum of the rewards in all the previous steps or what no, I, I'm not the, sure what I know what I what this yeah, is. Sorry. I understand. So imagine that we just do this, uh, repeating it again and again, and we don't change the reward. Like uh, the reward is set to be whatever number. OK. So um, the trajectory you're following is one that has like 20 steps. So you do this 20 times, simply, just a simple example. What you are going to collect as total return is 20 times your reward. So RT is the reward for that step. You are taking steps from zero to a finite number, capital T. And the total reward of the return is going to be just simply summing over the little rewards you are collecting every time you follow this loop. Is, is this uh, clear, Pilar? Okay, the, uh, I mean, uh, maybe when uh, it's a bit more concrete what RT is, uh, maybe it will become more clear. I don't know exactly what small RT is here. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's something that depends on the state uh, you are or the state you, I mean, or the move you are going to do from yeah, this so from the state. Re the reward, it, by the way, the reward is what you tune to measure your algorithm um, gets develops the best strategy. Okay, 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 that makes sense. So RT are the uh, ba basically your learning parameters, right? Exactly, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a way of saying it. Exactly. It's a function of the state you're in, the action you've taken, and how the the action you've taken changes the state you're in to the next state. State. So you did a good action uh, or took a good step. Oh, sorry, you, you, you took a, a good action, action, your state will change from one that may be not so good for you to a better one. And then you collect a good reward. But if you make a mistake, you should collect a bad reward or a negative reward because you are doing something that is not good. So yeah, the reward, this little RT, depends on this, all these parameters. And uh, here, the only thing we are doing is to say that uh, most often than not, you don't want to just uh, allow, you cannot allow yourself to just uh, scout over all possibilities and take as many steps you want. Uh, sometimes there are limitations, like you have time limitations. It's like if you think on this uh, deep blue between Gary Kasparov, uh, the machine had to take into account that uh, the players, when they play, they have time limitations. So it also had to limit itself in how many computations it did and how much it achieved in terms of uh, arriving to the next best move. Okay, so often we want to introduce this discount, which means that uh, the more steps you take, the more you are paying this price. And if you think intuitively, like in terms of uh, humans, right? Uh, you might provide uh, humans for their actions some kind of reward, let's say cash. And it would make sense for humans to keep maintain, keep doing those steps so they keep collecting those rewards to achieve a higher return. But often humans are not uh, like this, they are not so patient, so they prefer to collect cash now that cash uh, that they save for a few years. So iterations going over, oh, going over this loop, every time you do it, often in real situations, you need to pay a price. Doesn't come for free. Okay, so those are the key concepts for reinforcement learning. Uh, sorry, Veronica. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I didn't get uh, how does the algorithm know if the move was good or bad? It, it doesn't. It's you who give the reward. You set the I, reward. I, 
Okay, I mean the programmer. The programmer does. Um, for example, let's think on uh, on Go. You could imagine setting a reward that, uh, given the state of the board, if you place your uh, piece in a place, um, you can then evaluate whether, uh, by placing it in a particular uh, position in the board, you actually manage to kind of surround a tiny bit more a group of the opponent's pieces or a tiny bit less. And based on that, on the state that was at the beginning, after your action, the state that you arrived to, you can then place a reward that could be some, I don't know, some ratio of uh, how many pieces you manage to surround by the others. You know, the reward is something that you need to set. Okay, and, and then you have to analyze lots of uh, positions, no? This I mean, is a, lots of states. No? The, the machine has to do that. You can set a reward. Uh, in fact, the simplest reward is simply put a constant. Um, ah. And uh, you let precisely the, the algorithm run over and over and over again. And what the reward is making here is giving you a sense of the evolution of the game of how well you are doing, okay? Okay. So, yeah, you, we will see in an example uh, later on. Okay, thank you. I know that in this uh, lecture we are going a step up, like step up. We are talking about very advanced uh, concepts. So, and because of that, I thought that maybe you would like to watch a funny video. Um, in which they use reinforcement learning to teach uh, in a scenario with a board, let's say um, agents, with, and also agents that were acting against uh, another group of agents, and how using reinforcement learning by giving some kind of reward at each step on how much these, in this case, these uh, agents in blue were managing to uh, get away from the bad agents, let's say in red, and then uh, a total reward that res uh, corresponded to actually surviving or not surviving, actually teach, teaches these blue agents that have no clue about anything to develop new strategies that not even the programmers have thought about. Let's see if this works. I wanted to show you the video uh, just to lighten up a tiny bit. Are you able to see? Yes. And, yeah. and do you also hear? No. Should we you hear can't... something? I mean, from the video, you mean? Yes. And oh. if not, I can I can tell you, and that's it. But uh, so, if when I do like this, you don't you don't hear, right? No. Okay. So let me tell you then. I'm, I can hear you. Can I'm sorry. Okay, so the setup is the following. They set a particular region with boundaries, and we have these two agents, the blue ones, and they they are they, they don't know anything. They are placed here, and they have no clue whatsoever what's going on. They don't see you want. It's only by, for example, arriving here, they realize they cannot move because there is a wall. Then they arrive here, and they try to randomly start moving things, and... Uh, to see what is the use of these boxes, um, or for example, the use of this ramp. And uh, also they don't know that there is this guy here that it, uh, if it arrives to, to them, is going to actually kill them, okay? So these poor little blue guys are placed in this environment of which they have no clue about. And it's by going around in the environment that I'm finding signals of uh, for example, I'm not able to move, or this is good, or for example, this guy, whenever I find it, is actually killing me, that um, they start developing strategies. Now, the idea is that this game, that like each of these loops I was talking about, rewards and so on, will be made of many steps and will finish the trajectory that it will follow, it will finish when the, this guy kills them both, okay? So let's see what happens here. Mm -hmm. 
So you see the blue guys are just moving around in completely random fashion. So what's happening is that they, they train on this millions of times and they start realizing that, for example, the boxes are useful, that they have to avoid the red guys because they are buddies and so on. So for example, they realize after millions of iterations and you setting a reward, they realize that actually setting, putting this box over here blocks the, the red guy from actually attacking them. Then the red guy cannot uh, achieve it. So for example, the, the gains are always set by this attacker is set here or in a position and is not able to attack at the beginning. So that gives the blue guys the possibility of developing some form of initial strategy. And after a lapse of time, then the red guys starts trying to actually kill these guys, okay? So the blue guys, after, again, many iterations of playing this game, they realize that this is a good strategy. If they block the entries, then uh, the red guy cannot go to them. Only blue okay. guys can move. Only the blue guys can move the the boxes. No, actually the red guys too. And this is what is happening now. I don't know. You can see that the red guys, although they had a disadvantage, they they had a lapse of time before they can actually attack. They also realize, although they were focusing on trying to get the blue guys, they realize that they also have tools. So let me go back a second. They actually discover that they can use the ramps to go up and avoid the shelter and then go and they kill them and then the blue guys say okay okay so first thing we need to do go is to get this ramp from them and then they win okay so that's the kind of things they are they learn to do after millions and millions of times And they, of course, once they, they start developing their strategies, you can complexify this as much as you want. And what they do here is to learn how to construct their own shelter. Or for example, what they do is also hide these ramps so that the, the red guys cannot actually attack them. So apparently something that the programmers didn't think that these red guys will do is they, they learn to jump on top of the boxes and move them to actually use them as ramps. So they hadn't thought about it, but the alg algorithm learned how to do that. So one thing the hiders can do is actually lock things so that the other guys cannot use them. Essentially, this locking is just hiding them from the attackers. And they, they realize that the best strategy is while these guys are still, they are not able to move. Then they start locking as many as possible and only leave the ones they need uh, for being able to hide from them. So they actually learn, they learned that um, the attackers, the attackers had learned to jump on boxes and then they prevented that. So you see, it's, this is an environment that is continuously changing and as the, the ones that are hiding learn how to do something new that is blocking the attackers, they just learn some to, how to do something new then the ones that are hiding react by learning something new and modifying their own strategy. 
And this is something that, as you can imagine, computationally took uh, a long time, but is made uh, essentially using reinforcement learning and something that, uh, or some type of neural networks that are called recurrent and uh, that have to do with time series, um, led to the sorry, the algorithm to actually learn new strategies that the programmers hadn't thought about. Okay, so that was just for a funny video. Now, let's go a bit uh, higher up. We are not going to be able to run any of these things. Uh, we are not going to code uh, a game. Uh, we are not going to uh, do any of this stuff because it's uh, computationally very, very intensive. And the idea of teaching you reinforcement learning is not just for your own education, so that you know that this is one area of machine learning that is really exploding, that has its own uh, ability to learn in a completely different way, in a changing environment, changing the environment and reacting to those changes, but also because uh, it will be maybe in your own research, you might end up using this kind of learning. So I just want to give you some uh, higher overview of what this is uh, about. So clearly when we have to call for reinforcement, <laughs> it sounds uh, logical, it's because we have a very difficult situation, right? This uh, reinforcement is used when you have a complex setup, so complex, either because the data set we want to explore is impossible to simulate or because it's very high, or simply because the data set is not static, it's actually changing, it's reacting to whatever actions you are taking. So it's a complex setup with many possible trajectories one has to scout and decisions that need to be taken based on policies that uh, are not predetermined. So the states could contain lots of information. An agent could choose among many of, uh, options in terms of actions. The number of possible steps ahead could be very large, games you want could be very long, and the rewards uh, that one sets are, are there to help the algorithm to increase the final return. So when I say that it's the programmer who sets the rewards, it does it so that it helps the algorithm to optimize its policy and to achieve the best strategy, the sooner the better. So their ability the efficiency, how fast you arrive to this strategy, or even if you arrive to the best strategy, depends on the ability to explore how the, change, the states are changing by themselves, maybe because there is an opponent or the attacker that is changing things, or because your actions are simply changing it. So what reinforcement learning is doing is allows the algorithm to learn about an environment. You can think on uh, this uh, reinforcement learning as a way of developing a strategy per se, let's say when you think about Go. But you can also think on reinforcement learning, and this is also a place where a lot of the applications are, in which the reinforcement learning is helping you to learn the environment. Think again of, of think for example, on these little blue guys. They are left there thrown into an environment they don't know about. And it's by scouting around and, and getting this feedback from the environment, both the walls, the boxes, the ramps, but also the attackers, that it starts learning about it, things it didn't know about. For example, then it learns that the attackers have learned how to use the ramps, and then it takes the ramps. Or it learns that the attackers are using the, the boxes, so it learns that it better block the boxes before the attackers actually activate. So in robotics, for example, reinforcement learning is helping robots to uh, go around and actually understand the environment they are in and react and adapt to that environment. So as you can imagine, this is a big concept uh, with many possible implementations and applications. There are many possibilities, uh, but in general, the most, uh, most successful are based on deep learning, in which this policy optimization, this scouting over trajectories and policies, is based on neural networks. And also, 
those um, uh, uh, let's say policy optimizations that are made with a good adaptation to environment changes. For example, the good, uh, the best reinforcement learning, reinforcement learning algorithms, algorithms where the policy is not set to be a specific one or based on some random parameters, but actually is truly a function of the state. So that uh, the policy can have uh, terms that ap appear and disappear depending on the environment. So what are we going to do today? So it was rather hard, I must say, finding a problem that we could do uh, in the context of Google Colab because these problems are so computationally intensive. And many of the applications for, let's say, dummy applications are based on games, which, you know, they are fun, but uh, uh, they are not particularly interesting for physicists. So what I decided to do at the end is to actually follow for you, to ask you to follow a tutorial of TensorFlow. Uh, the idea is that you are going to take an environment called a card pole, which uh, then you are going to optimize using reinforcement learning. Uh, in this tutorial, they will tell you about the different reinforcement learning uh, algorithms and the different optimization policies and uh, the scouting and of the different trajectories and so on. But uh, what I would like you to do today is first start reading this post. Let me just open it so I can show you. Because I don't know about you, but I didn't know about this card poll. Essentially, you want to study reinforcement learning, you need an environment, an environment that reacts to you and it has some rules. An environment where you can act, an environment that reacts to your actions. Um, there are many examples in, in games, but this particular one, which is card pool, um, pool, pool sorry, is uh, the idea that you start, let me see if you can see this video. It's something along these lines. So you are applying random motions to this system and you reinitialize re and reinitialize until the goal of this learning is to actually get this pole pointing upwards and stay there, although you are still moving this. So you really want to, let me stop this, achieve this state in which the pole that would like to go down, you actually balance it up and although you are still moving it, you make the movements jittering from one side to the other to actually keep this pole up. Um, this is what uh, this TensorFlow tutorial will do for you. So it will show you how to set up this environment. It will show you how to learn from the environment so that you achieve your goal in the minimum amount of time. Okay, so I will start by reading this post so you know what's going on. And don't try to do what uh, this post is doing, meaning don't do this coding, just go directly to TensorFlow, that's this tutorial that is here, and try to run it, understand the pieces of the tutorial is well explained. So hopefully you understand most of it. And it's going to take some time. So it takes time just running these kind of things because they are very highly computational intensive. In fact, in physics, this kind of reinforcement learning is mostly, I would say, unexplored. And it's only used in complex numerical situations, like, for example, many body problems, fluid dynamics, and so on. In general, you apply reinforcement learning, uh, you call it big dance if you want, when you have a situation with many agents and interactions, and you would like to optimize something. Um, uh, you want to, uh, I don't know, fluid dynamics maybe not super intuitive, uh, except for people who work in fluid dynamics, but I found this particular example very appealing because using fluid dynamics and vorticity and the mo possible movement of fishes here, these are fish, um, this uh, paper using reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement was trying to find the way fishes actually fish together 
uh, why they do it in a particular configuration, assuming that what they are you doing is actually optimizing energy saving. So it's something that you want to have a look at. And what we will do tomorrow is um, there's only two classes left. I want to go the last one to explain Able AI. So the one of tomorrow will be. Veronica, I'm, I'm curious about. So, so this is when you say, I mean, what, what is exactly, I mean, what do they learn here? They, they have, I mean, they have some evolution of a system, which in principle is very complex, some very complex uh, system. And what do, what do they use this reinforcement learning for, actually? They are trying to understand if um, they simulate. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes. They are trying to understand, well, of course, this it is, it is very uh, like a complex, intense, uh, sorry, numerically intensive. But they try to understand why the fish, when they go together, why do you do it in a particular configuration? Whether this is actually responding to the need of uh, decreasing the amount of energy that the fish, I don't know how is it called, a group, as a, I'm sure it has a particular name. As collective, a group, collective. Thank you. The collective uh, energy they are using. And uh, so they think this is indeed the reason, and they try to actually simulate this to see whether there's a particular way of swimming that is more efficient than another, a particular configuration and way of, of swimming. And um, as far as I can read for this paper, it's not like they are not close to uh, pinning down the answer to that question, but they try. And the only way they can okay, try so they have a model. They have a model of what could be the reason. I mean, exactly. what what could be the reason, and then they um, so so they they give this uh, let's say this uh, <laughs> reinforcement to the movement, random movement of fish. And they find patterns that are, uh, I mean, that uh, resemble reality or something like that. Is that exactly, exactly? With the limitations, of course, they cannot take many fish at a time, and so on. But uh, yeah, that's the idea. Okay. Uh, just I wanted to tell you at least one uh, example, uh, which uses fluid dynamics in this case, that might be more intuitive. And uh, in this case. But do you know of any example where actually uh, people are using this to solve physical problems? Yes, yes. So in many body physics and fluid dynamic simulations, the way they are uh, improving their simulations is actually using reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, I can give you more references, but as I say, it's mostly unexplored, except when it comes to these very difficult uh, numerical problems which I think is just a lack of uh, knowledge that these techniques are there and they are readily to be used. Okay? Okay. Uh, I can give you more references, but uh, I didn't... Uh, since uh, it's, I'm assuming I have a, a wide audience doing physics of all kinds, they might not have intuition about fluid dynamics, like I don't have a lot of intuition. But it's, um, there are papers out there using deep reinforcement for this. All right, so just to tell you what we will do tomorrow, uh, we will do, if you want to scout more possibilities in which machine learning can help us solve problems in more non-trivial uses. For example, today's use in reinforcement learning, the whole setup and the implementations and the applications are quite non-trivial. And a bit more difficult to explain, I would say, in detail, than, uh, for example, uh, supervised and supervised learning. Just because we are so used to fitting functions, to model things, to try to find patterns in data, find anomalies and so on. This is in our vocabulary and our physical intuition, but not so much about this interactive um, action and reaction that is changing with time. And in general, even with time series, we have more difficulties understanding them. So what we will do today, uh, tomorrow will be to talk about uh, transfer learning, which has lots of applications in the context of, um, let's say, I would say, real life applications, and some in particle physics. Then we will talk about symbolic AI, 
or the fact that one can use AI to try to detect symmetries in, in our data sets, or even using machine learning to solve numerical problems like ordinary differential equations faster. Okay? And on the last day, we'll do explaining from the end. All right, so do you have any questions? If not, um, we'll see each other again at 12.30. See you later.